Live from Austin, Texas, it's theCUBE. Covering DockerCon 2017. Brought to you by Docker and support from its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE. I'm Stu Miniman. We're here at DockerCon 2017 in beautiful Austin, Texas. Had a great party down on Rainy Street last night, 5,500 people, and many of them, a good, good majority of them, made it to the keynote this morning. But we're digging in with a lot of guests here. Happy to welcome onto the program. I've got a returning guest in a new role, and I have a new guest. Uh, so both of you from uh, Puppet, uh, Deepak, Giri Thirugopal, uh, who's the CTO, and Omer Gazit, who's the Chief Product Officer. Uh, we caught up with you at a, a previous cloud role that you'd had. Uh, Deepak, since first time on the program, uh, you've been with Puppet for, for a while now, but yep. give our audience you know, a little bit about your background and your role. Sure, so I'm a software guy. I've been you know, programming forever, I've done a bunch of different startups. I actually lived in Austin and was part of the Austin you know, startup scene for quite some time. Uh, so I lived, I went to school here. So yeah. I've been here for you know maybe 15 years, something yeah. like is that. that. Is that a hook 'em horns or is that? That's a, a hook 'em horns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so UT Computer Science, um, and also fellow Texan, you know, Indeed. not UT but from Rice. So that's right. There you go. Owls are okay too. Um, but yeah, I've been uh, I've been working here for a while. Uh, previous startup I was at did a lot of email archival and stuff like that. So I was an early engineer there. Uh, we ended up getting acquired by Dell, but that was during an era where we charged people based on storage. So the more we could store, the more money we could make. Um, but that was really early on into how you use software to scale out a bunch of systems and things like that. So that's how I got involved with Puppet, the project, before I actually joined the company. So I ended up using a lot of that stuff to build out all the systems that we had. Uh, you know, maintained a lot of relationships with the community, have a lot of patches inside of Puppet Core. So uh, eventually, joined the company. So now I've been there for about six years. I'm CTO uh, and Chief Architect, so I'm responsible for all the ones and zeros, I guess, um, and uh, overall technical strategy. All right, so Omri, uh, you know, how long ago did you join Puppet? And uh, uh, you know, tell us about your role. Absolutely, seven weeks ago. So oh, wow. you know, fresh, brand new, but very excited about this new role. Um, as Deepak said, I'm also uh, a fellow Texan. Uh, I went to school with the Crosstown rival, or maybe the different city rival at Rice, but we've never, I don't think we've ever beat UT in football, maybe once. <laughs> um, so I don't even know what the, the, the Rice equivalent of you know, <laughs> Hook'em Horns is. Um, I uh, spent um, many years at uh, big companies like Microsoft, where I helped start .NET and uh, was really uh, deeply involved in Azure as well. Um, as well as uh, HP, uh, where I ended up uh, being the general manager and vice president for the Helion platform. Um, before that, I did uh, a number of startups, uh, including one here in, uh, in Texas, in Houston, that uh, ended up going public. And um, you know, the fun thing about coming back to Texas, I was, the last time I was here was uh, OpenStack Summit in Austin. It's uh, always going to uh, get great tech snacks, uh, so really enjoyed that last night as well. Yeah. All right, so, so Deepak, you've been with Puppet long enough that you know there was no Docker, uh, you, you know, That's there. True. I mean, containers did exist. Uh, can you walk us through? It? You, you, you have an architect role. Uh, how does containers impact uh, you know your product and how your customers are using you? I mean, I think it's um, there's a lot of interest. I think uh, there's almost not a single. I don't think there's a single customer or really user that I go and talk to, and I talk to a lot of them that are unaware of containerization, right? Like, they know it's a thing. I do think, though, that a lot of them are, are trying to fit it into their brains. And I think that's kind of the, the main role, I think, that, that we kind of play, because the products that we build and all the projects that we have, the open source or commercial stuff, you know, it's all about helping people automate, deploy, manage all the software that they've got, no matter what kind of software it is. So containerization to a lot of these folks, they come to us kind of asking, okay, well, I've heard a lot about it, or I'm getting a lot of pressure from development teams to start deploying stuff using it. How do we adopt that kind of technology in a way that comports with all the rest of our practices you know, for managing our software, right? Which for a lot of customers, they're still in the process of evolving. Um, because a lot of the people we talk to, they come to us to kind of move from more of the older way of managing, deploying, and automating their stuff into more of a DevOps kind of mindset where rapid iteration, continuous delivery. So, you know, the technology is definitely a big part of it. The processes are also a big part of it. But ultimately, I think they come to us saying, you know, this is really cool. It seems very different than virtualization. You know, um, 
So how do we actually deal with that? How do we enforce security policies on all these things? How do we deploy it? Can we share code? How do we stand up the container infrastructure itself? Uh, I don't know anything about software-defined networking. Now I have to. Uh, how do I get that expertise? And how do I configure that, manage it? And the applications themselves that are containerized now, you know, they're just architected and built in, you know, in many cases, fundamentally different ways than software previous generations. And that requires a lot of uplift of the rest of an organization in order to make that stuff possible. So, um, so it's happening, but I think there's definitely a gulf between the you know, kind of leading edge, you know, and a lot of the stuff that we've seen here in the keynotes today, which has been awesome. There's a ton of great stuff they've announced for systems builders and things like that. I can build custom kernels and all kinds of stuff. That's great, but there's a huge gulf between the bleeding edge tech like that and that tool chain and what, um, what I think most enterprises can fit into their heads, what they understand, what they have established practices around. Um, and you know, we have to meet in the middle. You know, obviously we can't bring all the new tech and make it snap to this line of how we used to do things, because that's not going to work. Um, but simultaneously, you know, we can't just shift everybody over to doing absolutely everything brand new, because you know they have this thing called paying customers and <laughs> revenue generating software that's already running. So, you know, how do you bridge that gap? And that's where I view our role is being that bridge to the future. Yeah, uh, absolutely. One of the things I liked in the keynote, they said it would be great if we just had this kind of easy button uh, that, that we do things, but I, I think as you said, it was you help customers take what they have, you know, help move them forward, help them make it easier. Um, you know, maybe when we talk about, you know, you join the company, you know, why is it exciting at Puppet these days? How do things like, you know, containerization fit into, you know, your, th your thoughts going forward? Absolutely. Um, I'm super excited to be at the company. Uh, I've worked most of my career really serving the developer customer, the developer constituency. And um, one of the things that I saw um, you know, working in the container ecosystem over the last few years is that uh, there really is a lot of excitement from development in organizations around effectively packaging uh, microservices in a new way. And the advantages here are real. You know, there is a lot of acceleration that you get um, but you know the larger movement of DevOps is actually how you get that agility, that velocity that um, that Ben was talking about in his keynote today. You know, there's only one mode, and that is quick, right? And that resonated strongly with me because we saw, it, it, you know, we saw, we saw that exactly, um, you know, at large companies like HP and obviously, uh, you know, at Puppet now, uh, where at the core of the value that we bring to our customers is helping them transform helping them do things in a more, uh, you know, kind of cross-functional way, uh, in a way where they can accelerate delivery from, you know, taking months to taking days uh, or even hours. And, you know, Puppet's point of view largely comes from, you know, the ops part of DevOps. And our customers are asking us, you know, what's our role? What's our evolving role in this new world? And that's exactly why it's so exciting to be part of a company that is actually bringing that unique point of view and most of our customers are asking, great, you know, containers, now what? You know, what about all the things that we have to worry about? What about security? What about compliance? What about reporting? What about, you know, kind of having visibility into my entire estate of things? You know, that doesn't change just because you go from running things on bare metal to running things in VMs. With containers, you have another order of magnitude increase of the number of things you're managing. And so the management challenges just become larger. And our job, you know, the way that we see our job is to really help our customers transition, employ these, you know, accelerant technologies like Docker, like containerization and the container platforms, but do it in a way that, you know, make sure that these operators continue to be able to do their jobs to, you know, get the visibility and the control they need uh, to make sure that, you know, they deliver on the objectives of the business as well. Yeah. Uh I had an interesting conversation with Solomon Hikes uh, earlier on theCUBE here, mm -hmm. and he said his background was actually on the operations side. And when they built Docker, it was with the developers as their customer. Um, what I want to throw it out to, to the both of you is to kind of that, you know, that developer, operator, and then kind of, you know, your enterprise buyer. What, you know, how's that dynamic changing? You know, we, we, we've, we've watched the whole DevOps uh, discussion, you know, for, for many years as to kind of, you know, who do you sell to? Who's actually got budget? You know, who makes decisions? Is it, you know, some, you know, C-level management that said, oh, I read about this and do it, or the developers bubbling things up? You know, where are things today? What, what, what are you seeing? Well, I definitely think the sort of, uh, uh, the era of, 
you know, you have one or two really high level buyers that make all these decisions about how everything is going to be architected. It's all going to be built in this way. It's all going to work in this way. This is how operationally it's going to work. Security is going to be enforced this way, mostly by just saying no to things. The way we make things uh, stable in production is to say no to making changes. Um, you know, if, if IT of the late 90s was a political party, you know, or the 2000s was a political party, the motto would be, no, we can't, right? Which, which, which doesn't make any sense anymore. So I think in 2017, um, I view, especially with respect to containerization, I think the big change is around empowerment, right? And I think the DevOps movement in many ways is about, you know, fostering collaboration and empowerment. So you don't want to have a separate security function that just puts, you know, I'm going to secure this application at the very end of the assembly line. That doesn't work. Just like it never worked for quality assurance or anything like that. We'll, we'll make it work, you know, we'll put QA in at the very end. Ideally, you want all of that baked in as early as possible, right? And I think stuff like containers has come, you know, I think the rise of containerization has enabled developers to feel more empowered over a larger swath of the stack than they previously maybe had the ability to be. You know, so if you believe in the idea of a container as being the unit of delivery of software in the future, I mean, that's a pretty powerful abstraction. So if I'm a developer at my laptop, you know, I can put all kinds of stuff into this black box, and the power is I have all the autonomy inside that box. I can do whatever I want with it. And that's really, that's very empowering. That's a lot of, that's a lot of responsibility. I think the flip side, though, and I think something that we've learned as part of the DevOps movement as well, is that it can't just be about developer empowerment. Um, it has to also be about operational empowerment. It has to be about security empowerment. If you think about it, there is, I think there's a, a future, I hope this isn't the one we actually get, but I think there is a future where, for example, uh, all developers are building everything with containers. They're like, great, I can put all the stuff I want in this black box, and then here you go. Here you go, operations team. Uh, here's this black box, and you can do anything you want with it. I mean, that's kind of a 2017 tech version of throwing it over the wall. Mm -hmm. Right, because the people with the pagers still have to care about what's inside that black box. And now, if you have a hundred development teams doing thousands of containers all the time, that's way more black boxes that you have to manage. So, if you're an IT director or a CIO or something like that, and you have to deal with your entire estate of stuff, you know that's that's pretty gnarly. That's a pretty gnarly problem. And then you have to combine that with all the previous generations of software that you still have and you still have to maintain. So. You know, I understand why our customers come to us a lot of times and ask us for, you know, is there a unified way that we can kind of model and manage all the stuff that we've got? How do we in see inside a lot of these things that are opaque and they are black boxes? So I'm aiming more for a future where the container is used as that unit of delivery for software, but it's used as a coordination point where it's not just developers putting whatever they want in a Docker file, but it's developers and ops staff, you know, coordinating to figure out how do we stitch these containers together into a proper application? How do we secure it? Does it meet all of our standards and things like that? And, and you know, that's, that's pretty great. Like, I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. that. That's a place I want to be in. Yeah, I, you know, just to amplify a little bit, it's great to be at a company where, you know, the users love the software. Right? I mean, our selling motion typically is a bunch of practitioners at a company really love using our software, and then we get a call from the CIO saying, hey, we have thousands of nodes under management. Uh, we would like to have a deeper relationship with you. Let's go have a conversation about that. So that's a, a fantastic validation of the value of the product um, as a tool of empowerment. And you know, I would say that, um, you know, just to echo Deepak's point, um, it's all about end-to-end -end velocity, right? If you're just making the devs go faster, you're not, not necessarily relieving the right bottlenecks. Right. And we've seen that even in our own development. As I've you know, come up to speed on how Puppet does things, some of the impressive uh, you know, pieces of focus really are on our own value stream, how the technology value stream in terms of how we get ideas to our customers. We always think about inserting operations folks, security folks, QA, development, product management, project management, all together and you know, collaborating from the beginning of a project or beginning of a sprint, and that, in effect, like, speeds up everything. So, you know, again, to echo Deepak's point, if you just make the life of the dev better or faster, you may not actually be solving for total velocity. 
Yeah. Uh, great point about just kind of that. What you know, why you guys are sticky, why your customers love you. Um, you know, Omri, I'm sure you've got great viewpoint, but Deepak, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, the cloud providers themselves. I look at the platforms out there. I mean, Docker is a platform provider. You know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. You know, others out there. Some of your previous employers. You know, build platforms, and they're trying to you know simplify and add automation and do this thing. You know, why are you guys? You know. Is this a big opportunity for you guys? Where do you guys become you know, relevant or even more relevant to, as time goes on with these platforms? You want to start, Omri? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the cloud is you know, the big platform disruption of our time yeah. right, in our industry. And you know, you're either going to write it or get washed over by it. And the most important thing that brought me to a company like Puppet is just this huge opportunity as our customers are moving to cloud platforms with more and more of their workloads, um, the ability to manage uh, a more heterogeneous set of things becomes even more imperative, right? The more complexity you have, the more you need tools to help you manage through that complexity. And so as we see our customers start managing nodes in the cloud, our job is to make that friction free for them. So um, make it as easy to, as, as possible to adopt Puppet in AWS or in Azure or in any of these cloud platforms. And on top of that, I would say, you know, we are also moving our entire portfolio to the cloud, you know, to become cloud native, to deliver in a way that, you know, again, takes a lot of the burden off of our customers' hands. Because if you see the move to cloud, one of the most attractive pieces of it for enterprises is that they can give up some, or perhaps most, or even all of the operations burden to another vendor. Yep. And that's an incredible, um, you know, kind of efficiency gainer for these enterprises. They don't want to run software anymore. Now, the vast majority of our customers still run software, and so, not just our software, you know, a whole bunch of other software, but their aspiration long term is to be able to hand some of that, or maybe most of that management burden to their vendors, and that's exactly the journey that we're also on. So that's why it's super excited to be, you know, to be at a company that it sees that you know, opportunity, that vision, and the expansion of market that that gives yeah. us. I kept, I, I, I agree 100%. I think the I think the big change for people that build applications or manage applications if they want to put them on the cloud is, you know, like at the amusement park, they have the sign where you have to be this tall to ride. Like if you want to have your stuff work in the cloud, you have to be this automated to ride. You just have to, because otherwise there's no point. I mean, what's the point of putting your stuff on EC2 and I can elastically bring up a, a zillion you know, instances of something if I have to provision them by hand or if I have to reconfigure them by hand? It just becomes a really expensive, absurdly expensive way to run um, a traditional workload that isn't ready for something like the cloud. So you know, that's why I'm really, you know, I'm really optimistic about you know, kind of our role and our customers are, are really, you know, we have a, a huge amount of coordination and involvement with them, trying to get them that automated so that they can take advantage of a lot of this technology. You know, I also think that you know, just the idea of being able to, for a lot of our customers and users, moving stuff onto the cloud itself is, you know, that's, that's challenging. I don't think it's as easy. I mean, I, I know there are plenty of people that, that have tools that do these kinds of things, but I just don't find it that easy to simply say, yep, you can just forklift your thing and now it's a cloud app. You know, like there's more stuff you've got to do. Um, and in my mind, I think step one, if you want to, if you have an app and you, if you have a workload and you want to move it to somewhere else, step one is you got to model what that workload actually looks, how that works. You have to have an understanding of how that's supposed to behave. That way, after you move it, Ideally, automation helps you move it. That's where stuff like us comes, that's where like our software comes in. But at a minimum, if you've got an understanding of how it worked before, now after you've transplanted it, you can actually validate it works the way that you want it to work. So I think automation is, a, is it's non-negotiable. You, know, you have to have that. And if you're not using a platform that lets you do that, um, then, I don't know, you're going to have a really hard time. And unless you're planning on having all of your infrastructure, 100% of it, your estate, with a single vendor in the cloud, you're going to need a platform that works across everything that you've got, from your mainframe processing all your trillions of dollars of you know, currency transactions or something like that, all the way to the app you built a year ago that you thought was Ocurrent, you know, maybe before you picked up a book on containers and the stuff that you're going to build tomorrow uh, that's going to be cloud native. You know, and, and you don't want 18 different tools from 18 different vendors managing stuff in 18 different ways because that's not really, I don't see that as a path to scaling out what you can do. Yeah, it reminds me of another quote that, that uh, uh, Ben used in the keynote is you need to be 
past and future proof. So yeah. we're going to have to leave it there at TPAC and Omri. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching theCUBE. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.